a uh, little bit about myself. My name is Mike Winthold. Um, my first computer is VIC-20. Anyone remember the VIC-20? 1.5K of RAM? Yeah. I'm um, an eight-year Navy veteran. Um, worked on avionics. Does anyone, any avionics background people? So you probably recognize some of these, maybe. <laughs> right, that's, that's what I uh, got my start in. But when I got out of the Navy, I decided that electronics is a little too repetitive. It's a lot of the same stuff happening over and over. I wanted something that was a little more dynamic. So I uh, took a chance and started working with computers. Along the way, um, I wound up on a DOD contract doing office automation right about the time the Army was getting serious about InfoSec. It's 8500.1. And we got involved in a lot of the uh, implementation stuff. And I found out that I loved doing the security stuff. And uh, how many defensive people do we have here? Incident response, things like that? All right, good. How many people love doing the defensive stuff? Right? Great, great, good. I love doing the defensive stuff. It's fantastic work. Uh, today I'm going to talk about a tool called Graylog2. Uh, it's an open source log management solution that was released in July of 2010. Um, it's a nice product. It's got two main components. Uh, a server component that receives all the logs. It's the syslog listener. Um, it'll take uh, uh, syslog over UDP and TCP and it has a few other inputs as well. And then it has a web interface for you to access all that log data. Alright, and this is basically what the main console looks like. So basically you have your messages or where if you do searches that's where your search results will be. Uh, you have a detail console that by default just gives you a graph that it's nice to look at doesn't really mean much. <coughs> and then you have some search windows and uh, other functions. Uh, Graylog uses Elasticsearch for the back end that's the main message storage unit. Uh, Elasticsearch is an amazing product. I assume a few people have worked with Elasticsearch, right? It's a great product. So um, on the back end, it's very fast. When you do your searches, no matter how much data you have, you get your results very quickly. It's really nice. Uh, it's very tightly integrated with Elasticsearch. So when you do your installation, you have to make sure that you're installing the right version. It also uses Mongo. Uh, it doesn't store anything in Mongo except statistics and also uh, the back end for the web interface, user accounts, things like that. That's all stored in Mongo. It's a Ruby on Rails application. How many people work with Ruby on Rails? <coughs> okay. It's terrible. It's terrible. I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, and when you're specking out a system, if you want to give this a try, you have to make sure that the Graylog server instance has plenty of processing power. It does chew up a lot of CPU. And then on the back end for your Elasticsearch, depending on how much you want to keep, you got to make sure that you size your memory and disk accordingly. Um, the Graylog server will take standard syslog over UDP. Uh, it does it over TCP. I've not tried the TCP. Um, the few times I've tried to work with syslog over TCP, it's not gone well. So I don't know how well that's actually implemented. It has AMQP support. Is anyone familiar with AMQP? All right, it's the Advanced Message Queuing Protocol. It's basically a, a messaging uh, middleware. So if you want to guarantee within the best of your ability that you have messages delivered from point A to point B, that is the way to do it. Basically, if you can get the data out of your systems into a, like RabbitMQ is probably the most popular, then you can configure your systems so that they will eventually get to your endpoint. Even if it's down, even if your network's down, uh, it'll all queue up, and as long as you have the disk space, it'll eventually get there. Another thing it supports is uh, it's extendable through Java. If you know how to write Java, you can write plugins. There's a few plugins already out there. The documentation's out there. I don't really know Java. I don't know how difficult it is. But there's some pretty cool stuff uh, that they've done. 
So they have a plugin to read Twitter. So if you want to pull Twitter feeds into Greylog, you can do that. They have um, outputs for, I think it's HipChat or Gecko Board or other things that some of you may be familiar with. It supports something called GELF, which stands for Greylog Inter Extended Log Format, which I'll talk about in a second. And it also has um, options to send data out to uh, is it Librato or Graphite. So if you want to do any kind of visualization, you can just configure it in the server file and uh, it'll start feeding that data right out. GELF is something that they started with the original Greylog implementation and it actually seems like it's been picked up. Uh, there's a few libraries out there that support it. Basically it's uh, logs in a JSON format in the JavaScript object notation and they're gzipped. So uh, you can send really large events over multiple packets. So like an HTTP uh, gzip chunked. Basically you can, uh, you don't have the 1024 byte limit that you have with syslog. So if you have people that are developing uh, they can send really large events about application state or event errors. They can even send a full stack trace in one event right to the server. Like I said, the libraries exist for PHP, Ruby, Java, .NET, Go. There's a few others, R, I think, but uh, they're out there if you need them. Also, there's some products that support uh, GELF. I haven't used NXLog but I know it's a pretty well supported product and that will convert your event, Windows event logs directly into GELF and send it to your Greylog server. Uh, Logstash is one of the I use. Are many people familiar with Logstash? Wow, okay, Logstash is a fantastic tool. Uh, they call it, the, they call it uh, the Swiss army knife of logs and it really is. I mean, it could even be a standalone log solution by itself but it does a lot of other cool things. If you want to pull in any kind of log, uh, you can do that and then send it in any format and it's got its own GUI even if you want to use that. It's a very good product. Uh, <coughs> we use Logstash to do field extraction mainly. So when our syslogs come through, you can see that over here when you click on an event, it breaks out all the data. We do that through Logstash. It supports uh, something called Grok filters. It's basically regular expression. So you define all your regular ex expression searches on the input and then you send the output to GELF and when it gets to Greylog it gives you all this nicely formatted fields. So when I want to search for an IP I get an alert and I want to search for that IP I click on that IP and then I get any other associated events with that same field and that same value. So like this um, it has a dest IP. All of my tools put out that standard format. So when I search that dest IP, any other alerts will come up in that search. So when you click on the field, it'll look something like this. So you have your, your field and the value and then the list of alerts that it's seen. And you can even uh, get a little more granular than that. Below there, there's a host search field. And I'll show you. or a, a you can filter it down by additional field values. This is a, basically what a GELF message looks like. If anyone's familiar with JSON, it's pretty standard. Things I like about Greylog. Um, it's open source. I, be I believe in open source software. It's done great for me during my career. Uh, it's very scalable. So not only can you scale the back end with multiple Elasticsearch nodes, but you can add multiple Greylog server instances. Uh, this is great because you're not limited by the capacity of one system. You don't have that one system that gets all the events. You can stand up clusters with multiple receivers. Um, log streams are great. A log stream is basically just to define search. So they call it a stream. You basically put in searches on different fields. And, um, and then everything that meets that criteria winds up in that stream. 
And the user permissions are good because then you can create user accounts that only have permissions for particular streams. So let's say you collect a lot of data and you have an audience that you only want to have a limited subset of that data available to them. Uh, for example, like with our telecom team, we want them to be able to see all the switch traffic and things like that, but we don't want them to see everything else. So we define that stream, then we create their accounts, they log in and that's all they see. So it's really handy. The alerting is pretty simple. Uh, it's basically a time-based threshold alerting system. So uh, you define how many events before it triggers over a certain period of time, and then it'll output to either email or Jabber, or if you know Java, you can write any output that you want. And uh, it is actively supported. The team, the people, there's a three or four people that support it. They're really good about uh, bug fixes and feature requests and things like that. I think right now they're going through a rewrite of the web interface. Can't wait to see that. Uh, but they're really good. I mean, it's an actively supported product. So this is basically what the stream looks like. So you can define the field. Um, and a lot of the fields are searchable through regex. And then you put the rules in. And then, yeah, basically you would enable it. And there you go. Like everything that matches that criteria either by host name, um, file name, full message, level, facility, you can filter on any of that. And quite often through regular expression. It's very handy. And uh, this is the alarm panel. You can see it's pretty basic. So uh, you define what the minimum number of messages is and over what period of time. And then when it meets that threshold, it sends alerts. And then you can set a grace period. That's a new feature. So that it doesn't spam you with alerts. Uh, the things that I wish it were better at, the web interface, Ruby. Ruby is a nightmare. Uh, especially for our team, I'm a big believer in the security product should be at least as secure as what we expect production to be. And uh, you're talking about least user privilege and SE Linux, and it, it gets to be a real chore to set it up. So you really have to roll up your sleeves when you get down, if you want to set up this uh, product. Depending on how much you want to keep, you need to make sure that you have the CPU resources and uh, storage resources and memory for Elasticsearch to support it all. The search is a kind of a, a strange thing. A lot of it's regex. But in some fields, it uses the native Lucene, which is the Elasticsearch syntax. So until you get really familiar with it, you wind up not remembering which fields support which syntax. Um, Lucene's pretty handy. It has things like fuzzy searches and distant searches, things like that that are really useful. But it's another thing to learn. The analytics are pretty limited. It's not one of those tools like, well, it's not one of those tools that'll do pretty dashboards for you. It puts out a few graphs. I haven't played around with the uh, Labrato or uh, Graphite stuff yet. I want to. But it doesn't do a lot of fancy management dashboards and things like that you'll see with other SIM products. <coughs> Field extraction is pretty tough. Um, the newest version came out with a feature that'll auto extract fields with an equal sign. So if you have this equals that, it'll extract that key and that value. And then you can search on it automatically. That's nice. But if you want to do any more nuanced field extraction, you're pretty much going to Logstash, or it has a built-in engine called Drools Rules, uh, where you're basically doing regex either way to do the field extraction. That can be kind of tough. And uh, I do wish the stream rules were more flexible. When you define multiple rules, they all come out uh, with AND logic. You can't do any Boolean logic where you do AND or anything like that. It's just AND, AND, AND. So that makes it a little tougher to get the results you want. So for us, when I started this whole process of looking at different open source log solutions, it was because um, well, about our organization, 5,000 users, smaller agency. Uh, we have about 10,000 endpoints. 
and we are very spread out, 200 sites nationwide. Some have a couple hundred users, most are 20 or less. Uh, but we did have a SIM tool that we inherited. We're not very happy with it. It didn't do the job. It's very Windows specific. Uh, anytime you tried to do anything with Unix, it was a, a nightmare. There was a Unix agent that came with a, about a 50 page document and that was it. And uh, anytime you call support or anything like that, they open up the manual and read right out of it to you. So they had no expertise in their own product and it just didn't work. Uh, it's a very temperamental system. Even just leaving it as a Windows only installation, it needs a lot of TLC. There's one person who's almost full time trying to fix agents and things like that. We've been trying to get rid of it. We just need to get management to buy off on it. Uh, see, right now it's required. It was pushed down on us. Uh, hopefully that'll change soon. But the worst thing was the forensics queries. It had a pretty good alerting system, but whenever you tried to do a forensics query, it would take hours, if not days. And that's useless because how many times do you get your search syntax right the first time? Never. So yeah, was, we needed something where we could get that quick response. So uh, the way we did it was that we wanted to collect all the logs. Um, even if we weren't, didn't want to look at them right away, we at least wanted to be able to reach back and do a full in-depth query if we needed to. So what we did is we stood up a big box with a lot of storage and we basically made that the collection point and everything goes to disk on that system. So if we ever need to do any real deep searches, we go to that system. Um, and from that central point, then we forward the logs that we want to, to our gray log server. In some cases, it's just a direct copy. It just goes straight from, from the collection point to gray log. Uh, in some cases, we filter it out and we use our syslog. It's got some pretty good features for filtering and forwarding and things like that. So then we drop messages and send what we want to. And then for some, like uh, the one that I showed earlier, we like to do real heavy field extraction and analysis and filtering and things like that. So then Logstash will sit on that box and read those uh, log files as they come in and process each one. Pull out the fields, send it to Greylog, it's great. And what that gave us was the ability um, to get really quick search results based on whatever criteria we wanted to, quite often IP addresses. We get an alert. We want to see if we got a HIPS alert that fired. We want to see if we got a, for any alert from any of our tools. So we search for that IP, bang, the results are right there. So we have more context and we can do a proper investigation. Um, and we also get a history. We are able to keep uh, enough data that we can look back a couple weeks and see if this is something that's recurring, what the trends are. Um, the alerting is, like I said, it's not really robust, but it does allow us to do alerts where we wouldn't normally be able to define alerts in different tools. So it gives us that kind of additional layer of protection. And it's been nice for us to work with the other teams and give them access to data. You know, our developers, they never look at logs, but now we can give that to them. Um, and we can limit it to only what they need to see. So it's been very, very useful for us. So if you're standing up a log solution in general, whether it's gray log or another solution, uh, you need to understand exactly what you're trying to accomplish when you do it, because that'll drive a lot of your decisions. When I stood ours up, I wanted to make it clear to all our production people, we're not retaining your logs for any kind of compliance. Any compliance issues, you have to meet. So that way there was no miscommunication about how long we'd store logs or what we're using them for. In some cases, you may have to know that. You may have to know whether it's SOX or FISMA or whatever. You're gonna to need to know if that's the role that you're uh, in, how long you need to store those logs. And that'll drive your budget and um, really your budget. That's the key thing. How much storage you're gonna get, what kind of systems you're gonna put on the back end. If you take away one thing from this whole talk, know your log sources. Uh, 
Things generate logs in strange places. Just forwarding your Windows event logs is good, but then you're going to find some case where something generated a log file, SCCM, that doesn't go in an event log. So we had an instance where somebody pushed a package that wiped out a few systems. They wanted to know who did it. Well, can't get it out of the event logs. Then you had to pull all the text files in. If you know that ahead of time, then you can work around that. You can get those logs in the system or at least know where to look. But you, know, you have to know where your log sources are. Otherwise, you're going to be missing things. Uh, DNS is another. DNS logs don't go in the Windows event logs. Um, applications on any Unix system that don't uh, quite, they don't always go to var log messages, things like that. You need to know where all your log sources are. And uh, another thing to consider is analysis. We tried to make this a tool that would make our lives easier, but it's a lot of information. If you don't set it up right, you know, I think a lot of defensive people have tool fatigue. You have so many consoles you have to work with. So you have to be careful that you don't make this another source of information overload. Um, other options, if you want to look around, OSIM is probably the most popular one. Uh, it's backed by a commercial product, but there's a community edition, it's open source. It looks very well done. Uh, ELSA is one that's relatively new, but it's done by guys that do incident response. So if that's what you do, it, it looks like they've done a great job with it. When I started out, it was a brand new product still rough around the edges, but we looked at it recently, it looks great. We may give it a try. Uh, it's worth a shot, I think. Kibana is one that is another Elasticsearch based open source solution. It does mainly analytics. If you want to pull just raw analytics out of your logs, that seems like a good solution. Octopus is one that I'm not as familiar with, but it's still actively supported. I looked at a lot of solutions and they would die on the vine. They just you know, people would stop supporting them. Uh, that's one that's out there. They just put out a new version. And you can always roll your own. I mean, you could do rsyslog, syslog ng, grep, whatever, Perl scripts, however you want to do it. There's a lot of solutions out there. Apache Flume, um, you can do your own thing with Elasticsearch. Depends on how much time you want to put into it. And if this bored you to tears, old fashioned. Right? Who likes whiskey? Okay, it's a great drink. Give it a try. Any questions? Who would put bourbon in all that? Me. <coughs> okay. <laughs> the pedantic hour just started, I guess, so. <laughs> uh, can you go back to the, uh, I think it was the Gelf slides? Gelf? Gelf, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, it's a goofy name. I had some questions, but I didn't want to interrupt you, and now I've forgotten. Uh, one or two. One more. Go. Uh, yes, thank you. So uh, I was curious. Do you know if uh, there's an Apache module that will an Apache logging module that will output directly either to in Gelf format or you know write a Gelf stream directly to wherever you point it? I don't know. I know there's PHP libraries mm -hmm. and uh, Ruby libraries in Java, like Log4j has a Gelf extension <laughs> in it, but I don't know about just like an Apache mod. Okay. The guy uh, who writes Gelf? What's that? The guy who writes Gelf is very open to ideas. All right. Cool. Uh, and then I think the slide right before this one, uh, you were talking about uh, fielded, uh, uh, maybe it was this one, maybe it was the next one. Uh, you were talking about, I think maybe you were talking about Gelf doing uh, uh, field extraction. Field extraction. Yes. So that happens when the logs are received and not when you run a search that requires fields. Is that right? So the way we do it is on our log collection point, which really all it runs is log stash and rsys log. The files are written to disk. Then we tell log stash, look at this folder for this file pattern. And it'll watch the files as they come in. And uh, it'll parse all that out. So when you write your log stash config, it basically tells it, here's my input, here's what I want to do to it, and here's the output. 
And then in that middle section, it's basically just big regex strings. Regex the, the yeah. The they call it grok, it's regex. Gotcha. So by the time it gets forwarded to Greylock 2, it's already been broken into fields. Yeah, it goes in that JSON format. Right. So if you were if you were looking at it as it went over the wire. It'll have whatever fields you can find. Yeah. And all the fields will be in there. Mm -hmm. So and then they become searchable and uh, it just makes it much easier when you're looking at events, especially when you take multiple tools or multiple sources and then you use the same field names. Yeah. So you can go through that and get the context and the timeline and things like that. So let's say you were doing that and then you realized that you wanted to break more fields out of existing records. Obviously you could update your filter, your, your patterns expressions so that new logs would come in and get the additional fields broken out. Uh, do you know if anybody has you know, worked it out so that you can basically reprocess all the existing messages, like reparse the full message fields. I don't think so. Okay. I don't Lost think so. Lots can do that. Yeah. Cool. After it's in the uh, yeah. Elasticsearch backend. Yeah. Wow. Nice. Okay. Yeah, very good. Uh, it bases it on um, a unique ID. It says, okay, I've already parsed a specific log with the same timestamp. Hold on, wait. <coughs> I'm trying to update it. Okay, I need to update this instead of add a new one. Nice. So log stash is amazing. That's cool. It really is a great great tool. At first I was kind of, when I was looking around, I said, oh, this stuff's in Java. I don't want to run Java applets, but it's surprisingly fast. Really fast. Blazingly fast. I mean, if you think about Elasticsearch, that's Java. That is incredible. These are incredible uh, tools. Is it scales like instant. Like you throw three more Logstash servers and there's no configuration. It's so, like you just toss them up and Elasticsearch goes and wham, you are done. Like you can I don't know if you know about Amazon Spot um, Spot instances, but you so Spot instance is a very cheap EC2 instance, uh, okay. um, and you can have it auto scale your your instant response in seconds for pennies. For like, I think the max I've ever spent on a Spot instance was eight dollars for a whole day. Cool. Yes. What do you see for size and speed on servers? How many logs do you have? Uh, we probably keep around 30 million events, uh, and I believe we're well under the, I think it's 500 gigs that we have allotted. Collection time on that many events? Collection time? Oh, that's a couple weeks. A couple weeks. Uh, I stood up, because we're still running the older version in production, um, they just released 0.10 and then 0.11 for some bug fixes. I stood up uh, a VM on my workstation, which is uh, 24 gigs of RAM, a couple of quad-core CPUs. Um, gave it a few gigs and without any kind of tweaking except the heap size on the Java engine, uh, we were getting about 75 or 80 messages a second without dropping any. That was when we were right about when we started dropping messages, just over UDP. Uh, again, if message, if you really want to get messages delivered, you got to look at the AMQP stuff. It really looks fantastic. So, uh, any other questions? Uh, you mentioned there were several people that were actively supporting Greylog too. Do you know if any of them have that as part of their day job, or they're just all interested in doing this in their spare time? Jordan says so. What's that? Yeah, there is. Cool. And there's actually commercials, you can buy commercial support for it now. And I think they're actually making it a cloud service, right? Like everything else. Mm -hmm. So I think they are, yeah. Yes? So what's the advantage of the AMQP over TCP? Uh, well, you can cluster AMQP and you have dedicated storage. Or when you have TCP delivery, um, you have to worry about queuing on your host and things like that. With AMQP, you set up a cluster, and then you deliver a message to AMQP, and then you don't have to worry about it on the endpoint. Uh, the AMQP basically handles all the routing and everything that you basically send it from the hosts. You configure Greylog to pull it in off AMQP. It'll do all the queuing. It'll do all the management and things like that. You could do TCP, but um, you have to worry about more what the effect is on your endpoint if your Greylog server goes down. Um, if your network has issues, it's gonna start caching and filling up your local disk. So, and plus, like I said, 
syslog over TCP, it's not good. I've tried it before with a couple other products before using Graylog, and it was just a mess. The logs would come out all kinds of different formats. It's actually worse, I think, than UDP syslog, which nobody follows the RFC. So, um, yeah, I would avoid it. Just my recommendation, but again, I haven't tried it with this uh, instance. Yeah, cool. yeah, with UDP? Yeah. Mm -hmm. With UDP? I, I know syslog in general, I don't know UDP versus oh, TCP, okay. but just from my experience with our side, something, if you send stuff to syslog, you can just have a message just drop off. And I have some things that send messages twice, just to make sure that at least one gets there. <laughs> so yeah, and like I said, you know, the Greylog server is pretty good about handling messages, but if you get a spike, you're gonna drop packets. You're gonna, you know, you have to decide how important getting all those messages is. You know, can you afford that lo those lost packets, or do you really need to have them? And that's something that when you stand it up, you need to really consider. Anything else? All right, thank you everybody.